today's panel is Education Without Representation. So I hope you're all in the right room. And we have a panel of exceptional education entrepreneurs who are working to make sure that we put an end to education without representation. They are also uh, an excellent panel because they are going to go way beyond representation and to talk about their commitments to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And why are they doing this? One, they understand the power of DEI, they are committed to closing opportunity gaps, and they also understand that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. So I think you're going to un uh, really enjoy this panel. And one of the things that they asked me to do was to get a sense of who was in the room uh, so that that would help them in shaping uh, their comments this afternoon. Uh, so how many educators do we have? Okay. Uh, Pre-K-12, higher education, um, founders of organizations, CEOs of organizations, chief learning officers, Chief Talent Officers. Did I see a Chief Talent Officer? Yeah, one of your people. Oh. Yes, I... um, foundation leaders, investors, uh, policy makers. Uh, the, the second I saw a policy maker, thank you. Um, and I know that many of you uh, covered several of those categories. The other thing we wanted to know is that we are assuming that you're here because you're also committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we'd like a little information on how long you've been committed to that work. So how many of you have been thinking about it or working on it for less than a year? Between a year and four years? More than five years. So people like me, you know, we don't have to get to 10, 15, 20. <laughs> All our lives? <laughs> we'll, we'll just start with over five years. Yeah, right. Um, we do hope that throughout this that you're, there are insights or wonderings or maybe something that is said that you would make you want to go home next week and try something different. Um, so we are also encouraging you to tweet uh, during the session. And as you, if you've been following the Twitter feed here, there are like three, four, five different hashtags. Uh, the one that's trending worldwide is hashtag ASU GSV 2019. And if we follow, we will follow up on those and, and be able to communicate with you. Um, did I miss anything? Those are the ground Ooh, so rules. Good. And so, oh, one more thing. At about 10 minutes, the last 10 minutes, uh, we do want you to think about something that you've heard here that may inspire you or that you're actually going to take action on when you get home. Uh, so be prepared to turn to a neighbor and share that. And I'll let you know uh, when you, we have 10 minutes left in the session so you have a, a little time. We were asked by the organizers of this panel. We did not organize it. We were invited to participate, not to use slides. So there's, there won't be any slides. We're going to have a conversation uh, among the panelists. And uh, unfortunately, because we have 50 minutes, uh, we won't be able to do Q&A from the audience. That's why we also want you to uh, share with us on Twitter and to have time to talk to each other. So. Um, all of you wear many hats, and you've been committed to DEI for many years. What's top of mind for you day to day? There is no order. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start. Hi, everyone. I'm Andrea Zayas. Um, what's top of mind day to day is um, how many hands went up at more than five years, and I think around this coffee table more than five years as well, and how very far we still are from where we need to be. So what are the real tangible gap closing efforts that we need to double, triple, quadruple down on every day is what's right there for me every day. Absolutely, uh, and you know, I, I run a company that focuses on social emotional learning, and um, as a content creator, uh, one of the things I look at and I challenge my team to do is, you know, every, whenever we put a course together or any kind of content together, um, uh, it, it should, what does DEI mean for that? Like, how do we create that content so that 
um, it appeals and recognizes and celebrates students of all backgrounds. And we actually have arguments on our team where we might look at a course and say, hey, how many stories have we told um, with students of this population? How many, how would we describe, when we talk about low-income students in our courses overcoming challenges, are we telling stories about, uh, are, we, are, we, are we having a picture of that kid uh, as, a, as a minority kid? Because then you might be uh, feeding into that stereotype that, that all the kids, and, and so uh, for me as a content creator, it means being intentional about every single story you tell, um, thinking about whether you're being asset-based, um, thinking about the impact you're gonna have on students of all backgrounds, and that gets baked in. We've had over a million students go through our trainings, so that's over a million students that hopefully have connected with content that's intentional. Um, and I'd say to any content creator out there, I see, I see some firms that are here that create content, I would ask you, um, how intentional are you? When you're sitting at, at, at a meeting, you're reviewing what courses you're coming out with, or what interventions you're creating, how <laughs> intentional are you about how that will impact every single learner, of, uh, regardless of their background, and, and that's where I think if, if there's a lack of representation, you may not realize that um, the content may, may be doing, um, the content may be doing some harm you may not realize if, 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 uh, without realizing it there. So. And Molly, can you tell us your company? Because we didn't do introductions yeah. because you have bios, but it would be nice on the first time that you speak that you give us your yeah. name, your company. Absolutely, so I run Maui Learning. We uh, create courses yeah. in social that's emotional it. learning. And I'm, we're going to come back to your social and emotional learning because that's really important mm -hmm. in the work that you do. Awesome. Do you want to say where you are? You said your name, but not I, Sure. Andrea Zayas, Boston Public Schools. So I would answer that question. You know, for me, I'm always. <laughs> name is <laughs> Who, Where are you laughing? Name, 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 name. So Carmita Saman, uh, founder and president of the Surge Institute, we really unapologetically invest. Woo, a lot of Surge <laughs> in the house. Um, <laughs> See, I told you I paid people to show up. <laughs> it works. It works. <laughs> um, we uh, at Surge really unapologetically invest in uh, leaders of color, um, specifically to elevate, uh, empower, and engage what we think is too often untapped uh, potential in solving uh, the problems that plague our schools, our systems, and our communities. Uh, and when I say unapologetically, that actually gets to a couple of the, the things that are sitting with me. So one is, I even in just through the, this morning, I've been in several conversations where there's already this implicit notion that there is a talent gap and that the issue is a pipeline issue, um, which implies that the talent is not there. Mm -hmm. And um, if, I was, if I was at home, I would, I would use another word. I'll just say, I believe that that is incorrect. <laughs> and um, because I think there, there's an opportunity gap that we often talk about with our young people, but we forget that those young people become the adults in this room. <clears throat> And um, so I think there, is, there are a couple of just inherent um, deficit mentality things that we bring into our thinking around this work that hinders us from being able to move beyond representation and box checking conversations into what it really looks like to empower folks who have shared experiences and perspectives with our students to be a part of changing those systems that we know have disturbed them and failed them uh, for decades. So that's, that's one thing. The other is, and we, we talked about this with Maui, um, I love that we are now broadening our conversations around SEL with students, but what we often don't acknowledge is that we're expecting adults to enable young people to do things that many of those adults can't do themselves. Right. And it's because they have been professionally trained in an environment that tells them to do the opposite of what we know young, we're asking young people to do. So if you're talking about agency, curiosity, risk taking, how many of our educators have been professionally groomed in environments that tell them that those are things that they actually need to shy away from in order to be su successful, um, deemed 
you know, promotable and those sorts of things. So, you know, the surge folks know this. I often say we can't actually lead people, students, to break through from our places of brokenness. So if adults haven't done the work themselves, then we can't see them as real catalysts and vehicles to ensuring that we unlock the potential in our young people. So in our work on this continuum, we work solidly with the uh, amazing adults who are working in systems and with students to help them do their work so that they can more effectively and efficiently and, and frankly from a place of heart do the work with the young people. Thank you. Hello Vincent. everyone, my um, name is Vincent Cobb. Uh, I serve as the CEO of the Fellowship Black Male Educators for Social Justice um, and our work is uh, to address the need for more black male teachers in classrooms um, across the country, but we are locally focused right now in Philadelphia as our pilot city. Um, here with my colleague, Rashid Coleman. Uh, honored to be here. I, I think in alignment with everyone is saying, I think we talk about the talent, right? The talent gap. And I think that's absolutely correct. I think we have to look at it as not about a broken pipeline, but it's about broken mindsets. Um, when we talk about recruitment, retention, and development of highly effective educators, um, especially those who look like the students that we, they serve, um, there's a lot of research that shows that students are more apt to be more invested in their education, aspire to go to college, um, really take pride in their community. And so I think what's on top of mind for me is the millions of students going to school every morning understanding that schools are a historical battleground of inequity for centuries. And what we are inheriting right now, what we are seeing, is an issue that has been unaddressed for years, for generations. And so now we have a unique place in history and time where we understand that representation does matter, but beyond that, the diversity, equity, and inclusion piece, we have to do the real work inside systems, school districts, um, colleges, universities, um, even settings like these where people have circles of influence where they know and understand that that representation not only is good for black and brown children, but it's also good for white students, mm. um, where we can defy the stereotypes that we often hear in the media um, when you're being educated by a male teacher of color. Um, it's pretty hard for you to be afraid of them. Um, so that is what our work is centered around every day, making sure that we can address that historical issue. Well, I love what you're thinking about, but I also think that having those things on your mind, ultimately you have some expectation of having impact, and I want you to talk to us about how you measure the success of what's on the top of your mind. You can have a minute to think about it, but I know, you, I know all of you have very specific uh, assessments. Yeah, so I'll start. Um, and because, you know, impact is something I think about pretty consistently. So to just share a little bit more about what we do at Surge. So we have, uh, we are founded in Chicago, but now operating in Chicago, Oakland, Kansas City. And we invest in uh, leaders who are already working in education. And we use education broadly. People think, I noticed that only about 60% of the room raised their hands when we asked who were educators. And I would argue if you're in this space, I bet it's closer to 95 to 100%. Educator doesn't necessarily mean you are only in a classroom. There's an entire ecosystem that has to work well for our students and their families to get what they need. And I would imagine that the majority of you in this space are doing something to actually elevate that work. So that, that is how we think of, of our work and that's who we target. Uh, specifically leaders of color within that space. And we go through a year of training that is what we call head, heart, and soul work. Um, the head work is about executive skills training because frankly, if you are going to run, dismantle, uh, rethink systems, then you know how to, you need to know how to navigate them. So I often say to folks, surge is wonderful, but if people leave surge feeling good about themselves, but they still don't know how to read a balance sheet, I haven't done my job very well because I haven't actually prepared them to lead at the next level. Uh, the heart and spirit work is about, as just going back to my point earlier, unpacking a lot of the limiting beliefs that we bring into the work that actually hinders us from being able to have the type of power, even if we are in positional 
places of power. Uh, position is not, does not equate to power. So there's a lot of unlearning around, you know, frankly, imposter syndrome and lots of other things that women and folks of color have been taught they have to be less of themselves in order to be successful. So when we think about our measurement, we measure that head, heart, and spirit. So we very specifically measure the content knowledge that our folks are gaining. We just did an ex uh, external mission measurement um, evaluation of our work where 100% of our alums say that they've gained executive skills. But we're also thinking about how does this work allow folks to work more co collaboratively? 87% of our folks are now in positions where they're leading strategies within the organizations that they're leading. 100% uh, of our folks say that they now intentionally work collaboratively across organizations in ways that they did not before. So for me, the, I could rattle off lots of numbers, but I think ultimately for us, we have to, and this is I think for all of us, we have to know wh what change we're trying to seek in the world and then back into what does that mean we have to measure and how frequently to know that we're having the impact that we desire. And that's where we currently stand. We still have a lot of work to do, but ultimately, our work is about arming folks with the skill and will they need, but frankly, the knowledge of self in order to go out and do this work differently and not just recreate the same narrative that we've seen that's failed our students. And one question on student, um, and I know uh, uh, others are gonna also talk about impact on student achievement. Um, and Surge has only been around for like four or five years. And what are you thinking about in terms of the executive skills, the head and heart, um, attributes that you are creating, how is that ultimately going to impact yeah. and change the and lives Deborah, of kids? how are you going to say only been around four or five years? I'm proud of those four or five years. <laughs> I mean, now I'm setting up for Hello, the audience. And this is a, this is, <laughs> yeah, because you know, most of us fail before we get to five years, but I also wanted to just set it up so that this is not an organization that's been getting ready to impact kids for 20 years, but hasn't gotten there yet. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. You know I get a little, like, when you start something at your dining room table and go broke doing it, every day matters. Like, every day, every hour, and I know I speak to lots of entrepreneurs. Um, so this is, so in our work, this is actually a really critical question because when you're investing in adults, and the only reason we're doing that is because we believe that the adults are a key lever to creating the transformational change for students that will lead to eventual you know, amazing outcomes and access for young people. But it's difficult for us, particularly over you know, a four to five year horizon, to be able to make that through line, particularly in a way that uh, is causal to say that what we are doing then has ultimately led to increased student outcomes. But the engineer in me will never die, right? So we started, I, I was a chemical engineer in a former life, happy to talk to anybody about that. Um, but what we have done is we have a theory of change that says here are the leading indicators. So we believe that if we can actually you know, get our, our fellows to have certain experiences, those experiences will lead them to have different sort of mindsets. Those mindsets will lead them to have different opportunities. Those opportunities will then lead them to have greater impact. And we are building a data case now that shows we have had the desired impact on them in terms of their experience. And we have started to then see how they are then doing their work differently in the world where we want to build the data case over the next five to ten years is in them doing work differently are we seeing increased student outcomes that wouldn't be attributed to surge and it shouldn't be but would be a direct link to um, our belief that having individuals who have shared experiences and perspectives with their students and with the communities leads to not only better outcomes for those students, but more sustainable outcomes because they're rooted in the knowledge of the brilliance and assets of those that they serve. I've been talking too much. No, no, no but I wanted, I wanted to make sure that we had this vision of, of what you do in the short term as well as how you aspire over time that the real purpose for this is to change the lives of kids. Absolutely. And I know that um, the two of you are also looking at student academic achievement in your work, so. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So um, ultimately, our job as a large public 
school system is, in to, is to ensure that every single one of our students is prepared for college, career, and life. So all the strategies that we're using right now, um, which really I'm proud to say that I'm part of one of the most progressive districts in the country, we have passed policy that's actually called the Opportunity Gaps Policy, right? So we've, we've created a set of supports for the system, which is policy. I think policy is actually intended to support the system in fulfilling its promise and its mission um, for students, families, and community. So there's policy. And then there's practice, right? So how are we moving toward actually um, fulfilling the goals, the metrics, the key performance indicators that are outlined very clearly in that policy that was passed in 2016. It has um, pieces in there around hiring, around ensuring that our curriculum is uh, culturally sustaining, ensuring that um, at the school level, we're closing the gap between um, who our students are in terms of their demographics and our teaching staff, right? How close is, how closely mirrored are those two um, populations? So there are year over year goals that school leaders um, are supported in meeting through our human capital office, right? So it's down to the granular level of then how are we ensuring that, the, that we are uh, creating opportunities for our educators of color to connect with school leaders so that that matchmaking happens, so that the hiring can happen and we can close those gaps. Everything from that to ensuring that we have a team of people that is annotating the curriculum, going through and making sure, like you were saying, Maui, not only you know, are the characters reflective, reflected, uh, uh, reflective of our students, but how are we telling the story about conquest? Andrea, how are we seen, telling the story um, as about... As you implement these policies and procedures, yeah. have you seen any uh, changes in the academic performance of students or the social and emotional learning of students? So, so, social emotional learning and culturally and linguistically sustaining practices are part of the foundation, right? Um, Impact-wise, it's something that we're measuring over time. The Opportunity Gaps policy was passed in 2016. Um, I'd say we're measuring right now the steps that we need to take to ensure that every single one of our teachers is equipped, trained well, um, and prepared to deliver that. Because to Carmita's point, if we don't have folks at the front of the room, the back of the room, in all places in the school system that are prepared to deliver on that policy, we are not yet changing the game. So Vincent, why don't we go to you next, since sure. uh, you're working with, uh, to increase the number of black male teachers and Maybe you have some very specific things that your teachers have, have been able to show change over the time that you've been able to work with them. Absolutely. Uh, uh, my co-founder and I have fumbled with this ball a lot of times about <laughs> metrics, right? Like, mm. We get this big, bold goal um, in Philadelphia that we want 1,000 black male educators by the year 2025. And as we start to tick up on that number, we start to internalize whether that is the right message we want to send. We don't want to be accused of this idea of tokenizing a system that doesn't create welcoming environments for our black male educators, because just as fast as we can get them in the door, they'll leave. Mm -hmm. And so um, it is a revolving door. So we start to focus more on what are our promises to students and community. Um, we want to focus on our metrics around exposure. Normally, black males are not tapped on the shoulder to become teachers until mm -hmm. junior year of college, whereas a white um, girl is tapped on the shoulder at third grade to say, you would be a great teacher, and she's groomed in that way. So how, what are the quality experiences that we're providing the students to expose them to opportunity? We have a full gamut of programming, high school, college, mid-career changers, all the way up to current professionals, where we are making sure that we are sending the right message around what it means to advocate for students and community. Skill and will, those are huge, right? What are the skill gaps that we are addressing that school districts may be missing? Or how are we changing and pushing back on their system to say, you know, for you to be a quality school where we want to place black male educators, you have to reach this bar. So that we're pushing back on systems. So it's not that we're trying to fix black male educators prepared for the experience, but that we are telling school districts that this is the standard that you must come to. So we start telling principals who say, we want more black male teachers. We say, your school is not ready yet. 
we won't place black male teachers there. Um, because we believe that school districts oftentimes place black men in the most challenging schools, right? Because they're seen as a disciplinarian versus the instructional experts. And so um, we wanna kind of change that mindset. So that's part of our metric as well. And then what we see around the willingness for more black male educators to, or candidates to wanna go into education, and that happens at the college level, right? It is what is the stereotypes, what are the images and messages that you know these candidates are receiving to say, I don't wanna go into education at all because it's low pay, terrible schools, terrible administration. So what are we doing to make sure that we, as we are training them for that experience, that we're also addressing those issues um, that may be prevalent. And so we are constantly shifting the dial on um, one, how do we make sure that we have highly effective educators that we're producing? How are we making sure that our students are getting the exposure they need so that they can see education as a career path? And then um, three, how are we making systems more accountable um, so that we can make sure that we dismantle that power dynamic between um, the institutional racism that we often experience and what they can do to change that. Deborah, can I jump in and just say one more thing? Sure. Um, that while we, we're, we're at the beginning of measuring what that looks like in Boston, that the national research is unequivocal, right? That when you have a teacher that looks like you as a student, you are, um, your, your learning accelerates dramatically, right? All of the studies show us that. Um, so I just want to make sure that like that, we, we know that that is the case. Um, most recently, TNTP um, issued a report called The Opportunity Myth that shows that expectations by and large, it's the, it's, if, with higher expectations, an educator can more quickly close gaps than with um, more time in the classroom, right? And so, and we know that expectations and representation are linked. Mm -hmm. So to your point about mindsets, Carmita, right? So if we put a black or brown teacher in a classroom, we are almost guaranteeing that expectations are gonna be higher and within a, within a school year's time, we're more than double, more than, more than twice likely to close opportunity gaps as a result. Samawa, can you talk to us a little about the social and emotional learning uh, work that you do and how Absolutely. that impacts student performance? Absolutely, and one of the themes that's really jumping out at me from my fellow panelists that I think is so critical, um, I would encourage everyone to really think about this, is I truly believe that the best way to help students within a school, not at what happens at home, but within a school, the best way to help the student is to help the educator. And that's why you're hearing from folks, it's the mindsets of the educators, it's the practice of the educators, it's the representation. And I would, if I, if I could train um, five students for one educator, I'd train the educator and increase their capacity because that ripple effect will be uh, just tr tremendous, right? Um, in terms of some of the ways that we think about social emotional learning, uh, in terms of measurement, the seal of good housekeeping in social emotional learning, uh, in K-12 at least, is, is CASEL. They're a phenomenal trade organization. Uh, everyone, I encourage you to go to their website. <laughs> CASEL is fantastic. And so we, we and, you, and we're on their list of evidence-based um, programs that's coming out, um, updated list, and we had to do a control group study for that. So we, we, we went through all those things um, that are required in terms of data there. But Deb, I gotta tell you, the things that I'm, I'm more proud of from uh, just a gut perspective is, um, Vincent, to your point, I had a school that was 90% Caucasian students, um, I had their principal call me and tell me, wow, we got feedback from the students that they're not used to seeing this kind of diversity in their education. Hmm. So the idea that we don't just do this for the African American students or the Hispanic students, but we're doing this for all students and, and is something that's critical, right? I'm deeply proud of that, right? That they're, and uh, there's someone that's renewing again this following year for us to kind of shape their vision. Um, other things I'm proud of in this space that don't always you know, they don't fall in the same category as getting on a CASA list. Um, one of our partners uh, contacted us um, and they said, look, this course that you created is not working for our Creole speaking students. There's 20,000 Creole sp speaking students in our district. And, and for me, um, being a refugee from Ethiopia, um, uh, understanding language difficulties, um, it wasn't necessarily a profit maximizing thing for my company to invest in that relatively minor language compared to Spanish. But, but I authorize that, right? And, and we translate a lot of videos that have since been watched over 100,000 times. And the course completion rates for that population went up by more than 10% in that district. Mm -hmm. That's again why you have to have people from different backgrounds at the table making decisions with mm -hmm. budgets, 
with direction because mm -hmm. if it's in your bones and you've gone through those experiences, it's not just about the dollars and cents. And by the way, um, in, a, in a twist of faith that I would have never predicted, that course actually ended up being our most popular course because a lot of other kids end up taking it. Um, and so sometimes <laughs> doing the right thing also ends up being the profit maximizing thing. So I would say all of us here probably look at some metrics that we're proud of, yet it's some of these stories, like, like that school mm -hmm. calling you up and saying, wow, it's the white kids saying that they love seeing the diverse <laughs> uh, students that make you think, wow, that's awesome, yeah. right? This is, this is incredible, right? Yep, so we also, there's always these unanticipated mm -hmm. outcomes. Some of them are not always negative, yeah. uh, and that you can always have the more positive contributions that you didn't plan for. Um, Deborah, can I just, can I, one second, I just want to emphasize something and make something um, explicit that has been implicit in all our comments. So one of, and people who know me well know that I don't shy away from saying anything ever really. <laughs> and, and one of the things that, um, that I, I'm finding myself having a lot of dissonance around in DEI conversations is that that's become the buzzword in the same way that, you know, before it was about uh, quotas and that, like it's just become the, the latest thing. And, and not having conversations around really unpacking what it means to actually have shared experience. So what Maui just talked about, that wasn't just about representation. It, and, and I, so I use the language often of really understanding what it looks like to have people who have shared experience with the students and communities, which often doesn't just mean we're the same race. Right? It doesn't just mean we're the same gender. So when I, when I go out and talk about Surge, I, I talk about the fact that I grew up as a poor kid in the projects and, and education being my pathway out. Not to seek sympathy from the audience, but to say I know what the hell I'm talking about. Because I, I was the student for whom this was a pathway out of poverty. And that means that when I'm, when I'm in my work, when I was in K-12 uh, at Chicago Public School, schools, I brought a different understanding about the assets within those communities. So I would sit in meetings where people were all making all kinds of assumptions, not because of malicious intent, but because they had no shared experience about what those parents wanted for their students, what the students' aspirations were. Absolutely. And, that, and those are the kinds of things. And I think in these rooms, we have to get beyond the buzzwords yeah. and talk about if we're really going to change how we do this work, we have to tell the truth. And the truth is that we all bring unique, and as you said, like our, and, and Aaron Walker says all the time, like our genius is equally distributed. Mm -hmm. uh, access is not, right? And so we need to tap into the unique genius and brilliance that we all bring, but understand that that connection and that shared experience is, is what is going to be transformational for the student experience and ultimately the outcomes. That's perfect, because the other thing I wanted to have you guys talk about is that you do your work and you may do it with that deep commitment and that passion, but at the same time that you're building and growing an organization, you're also trying to impact the larger field. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons you're here today and that people invited you and I thank you for coming, but talk about other ways in which you impact the field at the same time that you're building your organization. Well, I'll, I'll jump in a little bit. One of the things that um, I've heard Vince talk about is just the dearth of, of black male teachers. I can tell you, my, my schools growing up, I didn't have one black male teacher from first grade to 12th grade, and I maybe had 80 teachers. And I feel like one of the great things I get to do through EdTech is through my company, um, I've been a black male teacher for over a million students because I, I can leverage the power of technology. And, and my thoughts, my mindsets, our team coming together. And so I think this, this conference and the innovation it represents and the ability to leverage tools and to kind of do things that you know kind of overcome limitations that may seem and so how do we take some of these folks that um, uh, that are a part of the work we're doing and scale it so we're able to reach uh, every single student without us having to be there in person mm -hmm. right those are some of the um, things that I'm interested in as, as part of um, and that's where my company has seen the fastest growth is in being able to innovate and leverage technology through online and blended to have some of this impact, to be able to partner with major organizations. And um, I'm proud of that. I, I, wanna, I think there's a lot of myths about what can and can't be done with technology. 
that, that we need to kind of rethink and leverage together uh, and measure to see if we can scale more quickly. And those are, you know, I think those are exciting things for us to be exploring together right now. Uh, I would say, I think the wider impact, one of the things that we've been successful at the fellowship is that we've been able to impact the wider narrative around what it means to teach. Um, when we talk about folks coming into the system, we see teaching as revolutionary. We see it as activism, social justice. And I think historic, I think it hasn't been talked about in a way where folks can see their true imprint on schools and communities and um, folks who are impacted by that system. Um, because we have real conversations about what it means to feel isolated in that setting, but also what it means to have agency in that setting for students, for themselves. Um, we, we ask a question like, where do these messages come from about teaching, you know, being this kind of poor profession? And a lot of times it comes from the teachers that are in the system. And so how are we making sure that we are, have a message around impact, around students' interest in education, around how we, it's just not about what happens in that classroom, but how we're changing the mindsets of those in that school building and the wider community about it, what it means to invest in a school and see success for our students. And what's your impact beyond Philadelphia? I feel like, yeah, so <laughs> we get this question all the time around weighing uh, chapters around the country of black male educators who are um, very inspired by the work that we do. So we have an annual national convening every year. Uh, last year we had 1,100 educators and um, school leaders attend, uh, black male educators. And so to be inside that affinity space, folks are saying, yes, this is what we need to do. And it's just real inspiring to see the black men themselves say, let's create this community um, around, among educators so that we can have the wider impact in our city. And so while we're trying to double down in Philly, we're also having the wider, the broader conversation around what this looks like as a collective of uh, organizations who want to contribute to this cause and more representation in schools. And how is Boston sharing with other large urban school districts? Um, we're part of the uh, Council of Great City Schools, and so we're often sharing our work there um, at that level. I think a lot about um, scale and micro and macro and the ways in which through my particular role I can both um, connect with others across the country. Um, being part of EDLOC, Education Leaders of Color, is one way. Um, and also then thinking about what is, what, how can we take these practices, principles, and policies to the micro level? Am I mentoring a young woman? Am I working with and ensuring that I'm keeping my eye on all of the young people of color that are in the organization that need, desire, and are hungry for mentorship? How are we creating safe spaces so that, um, safe spaces and also spaces of empowerment, little mini surges wherever we go <laughs> so that folks not only have um, opportunities to practice and to be skilled up, but also have some insulation because we know that if, um, if without the proper insulation, and maybe that's not the right word, um, organizations will find that you are not the right culture fit well too, um, well too soon before you're able to make your impact. So how are we creating those kinds of spaces, both inside at the micro level, inside of our work, and, and then sharing that beyond our walls? I often use this example of, I worked at Chicago Public Schools for a while, and in that role, um, there was a time where I, I um, was chief of staff for high schools, and that meant I had budget responsibility for a, a lot of the organization. And I sat down with a woman who was an executive director over a big part of the organization. So at that time, Chicago Public Schools was about a $6 billion organization. This woman was an executive director over a $500 million piece of that, had been a phenomenal educator, principal, coach of principals. And in a meeting with this woman, I realized that she was being charged with leading an organization and balance, balancing a budget. And she could not read a net income statement or a balance sheet. And at that moment, I thought, that is not this woman's fault. Mm. Actually, she has been promoted to a position, and when she can't do this job, it will be made to be her fault. It'll be, oh, we gave her a chance. Mm. And she just didn't step up to that chance, but she hadn't been prepared wow. with the skills in order mm. to take advantage of it. And I share that because I think we don't, and, and I, I, I speak the same way in, in diverse mm. company as I do in real and in, in family. Like we don't get the same opportunities to fail. Because when if and and what I hear you saying is that we have to as institutions recognize how we are if if 
anyone who is an innovator in this space will tell you that you get the most out of being able to take the most risk and encouraging people to fail. Yes. Because in those failures, that's where that's the learning, where the learning is. Mm -hmm. And too often, women and folks of color are not given that safety net right. and allowed to fail. And Vincent, I think you were saying earlier that um, black men are most often put in the most difficult mm -hmm. positions, yes. right? <laughs> I heard somebody call that recently like the glass cliff or something like that, <laughs> right? Wow. Like where it's, it's, it's not that you can't rise up, oh, yeah. right? Which wow. there's, you know, there's the glass um, labyrinth, right? <laughs> also for, because if you, if you look at that through an intersectional lens, there are lots of different reasons why, not just one ceiling, but there's a whole labyrinth of reasons why. Um, but this idea of a cliff, right? Like you are working hard, you're doing your best, but there is no way that right. you're gonna be, it's, it's what you're being asked to do is unreasonable. Yeah. And so then there's a cliff and that yeah. could have extreme, yeah. Um, disproportional consequences for people's careers. Yeah, and the narrative gets Motivation. twisted, right? It's like after you fall off that cliff, folks say, well, black men don't want to teach. Here we go. It's like, but right, we haven't said it. It's a, yes, yeah, self-fulfilling prophecy. And we push them out and we say we can't find them. So it's so funny when we, get, we talk with talent teams and say, okay, we, wanna, uh, we want black male educators. Where are they? Like, we just have them in our back pocket. Um, you just don't say, you? Go. Don't right. you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so... It, it is very much that, like, right? It, like you said, in the failure, that is where the most learning occurs. But also, school districts are failing us. And we feel like there's learning that we need to really give to them so that we push back on those things that put us in impossible situations to be successful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have about two more minutes before we ask the audience to talk to each other. Um, I, I want to talk about one or two things. Uh, one, how we bring this DEI work into AI, uh, and um, where you see this work, well, let, me, let me hold that one. How, how does this conversation about DEI impact AI and technology and accelerating innovation? Well, um, so there, there's even, um, there's, there's been a lot of news recently about how uh, some of the AI technologies are having disproportionate negative impact on people of color. And, and uh, when folks take a closer look, they're realizing that, there aren't, um, that the folks who are actually creating these AI programs are, um, all look the same. They're all from a similar background. You just saw um, Facebook just got sued. I don't know if you saw this, mm. this last week. They got sued because um, on their platform, uh, their platform en enabled housing discrimination, right? Mm. So, you know, I would like to think if someone like myself was on that team, and, and I, grew, I grew up in, um, you know, I grew up in low-income housing, and then I remember when I got married, uh, the first apartment my wife and I got, I, I went to go try to rent it, and I vividly remember thinking, I wonder if I'm not gonna get this apartment because I'm black, even though I went to Harvard. I wonder if, the, if, if they're just gonna look at the color, and that's a thought, so if you have someone who thinks like that at the table, I don't think Facebook's gonna make that same decision, but if, if people haven't had to struggle with those kind of things, and so, um, I think everyone sees that AI is going to be a, a really critical part of our future workforce, many other kind of things. Um, a lot of schools now uh, are scanning people automatically when they come in to see if they are a threat, that kind of thing. Um, so so I, I, I think there's some ethical questions around you know, who's, who's programming these, 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 these algorithms and um, how do we do this in an ethical manner and how do we make sure that uh, folks from certain backgrounds, um, and it could be any background, aren't harmed like, from doing this. And so I think those are all things that are very much being figured out right now and talked about. Yeah, I, I, I just would add that um, part of the way that we're thinking about, um, so there's a support, there's, there's a piece around accountability that I think has to be considered. What are the policies that are in place that um, create those checks and balances or those um, sort of procedural locks, right? Where folks can sort of stop and take stock. Have I, um, a, a, a simple checklist of things. Have I um, conducted focus groups with um, folks great. of color that are going to be using this, um, this system? Have I, um, have I put this in front of young people, right? Um, the real, the, the end users, right? Um, I think there are probably a number of things that could be considered as part of a, 
that folks that are in this big room could consider um, as real policy implications for how IA gets developed over time, AI gets developed over time, to serve our communities in particular. So well, let's give our panelists a um, <laughs> Uh, and I hope that you all will agree that if we are not going to accelerate uh, innovation, if we are not on a journey uh, to expand diversity, equity, and inclusion, and hope and thank you all for coming to this session and continue to advocate for that at this conference and every place that you are. Thank you. Thank you.